Center. So what can be done to address the vulnerabilities that Murray points out? Retired Lieutenant General Andrew Leslie is a former commander and chief of staff of the Canadian Army. He also previously served as liberal as a liberal MP. Hi, General Leslie. Good to see you as always. Thank you for making the time. Thanks, Rashi. If you were to assign the readiness of our forces, should, as Murray described, the, the sort of uh, actions of Putin change and go further than Ukraine, uh, if you were to assign a grade, what, what grade would you give the forces? The quality of the troops themselves, air, land, sea, special forces, I would say, obviously, somewhere in the A, in terms of their actual training, especially advanced training, partially as a function of COVID, but also due to lack of money, probably ranging from C plus to B. Having said all that, this could be an existential moment in terms of our commitment to NATO. If not now, when in terms of deployment? So at this stage, really it's come as you are. And we owe it to ourselves not to repeat the mistakes that were made just a week ago when a whole bunch of folks saw the Russians massing on the Ukraine border, but didn't believe he would attack. And those same people are saying once again, by the way, once he finishes with Ukraine, despite the best efforts of the most valorous Ukrainian defenders who are inspiring all of us, he won't attack anywhere else. They've been wrong once, they're probably gonna be wrong twice. So what is the implication of that then? And by that, I mean, are the are the strategic discussions that are happening right now, should they be, what do we do when that happens? What do we do if that happens? Does that involve, uh, you know, providing more support for the resistance? Does it involve, you know, coming up with a wall around Ukraine? Uh, what, what, what do you think? Ash, you're on the right track. Yes to all. We have to do more to help the resistance. It's been day three or four. Minister Nan has actually done a good job in the last couple of days of getting uh, lethal munitions and lethal assistance out the door to Ukraine. Mind you, there was nothing for the two years before that, but that's not her fault. What we have to do now is focus on the next step. Let's get ahead of Putin in terms of the decision cycle. The brave defenders of Ukraine are going to give their all. That will buy time for NATO to position its forces along the eastern flank of NATO. And Canada must and should commit the full 3,400, probably into Latvia, because we've already got five or 600 there. And quite frankly, I do not accept Minister Nan or the government of Canada's interpretation of how the NATO tasking cycle works. We shouldn't have to wait for the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe to do this sort of thing. No one else is. The Americans are deploying thousands as we speak. The French are on the move. The Germans have already started sending main battle tanks and heavy artillery to the same sort of regions. And the list goes on. So now is the time to get ready to stop, essentially, Putin, hopefully without triggering World War III. Uh, let me ask you a little bit more about the last point you made, because uh, I, I'm, I'm not an expert like you. I'm just a layman. So I tried to call behind the scenes and figure out, okay, what does this mean at the readiness? Um, and what I was told is that uh, 3,400 troops are ready to be deployed, but they need to be told exactly where they are needed. At that point, once they say, okay, we need you know, uh, 300 of you here, 400 of you here, uh, it's anywhere between five and 34 days from that ask uh, during which they can be deployed. Are you saying that, that that's not true, that, that everyone could be sent uh, sent right away, or, or if the ask isn't there, if they don't know where they're going, does that even make sense, I guess? Well, it's not a question of an ask from NATO. It doesn't work that way. The various contributing nations of NATO, which Canada's one, go to NATO and say, hey, we have 3,400 troops and we'd like to send them to marry up, I work alongside the roughly five or 600 we've already got in Latvia. Not sending them to Latvia would be illogical because we've already got troops with experience in that terrain. They know the local populations, and there's a support base that's in place and a very welcoming reception from the local communities and indeed the entirety of the nation who like Canadians. So quite frankly, if we have to choose a place to stand and fight against Putin, that's a hell of a good place to do it from. Is the military's capacity beyond, let's say, beyond that 3,400 troops? L let's say it does get much worse. It, and I know this is all hypothetical, yes. but it does get much worse. Like, Murray's point I thought was so interesting about the, the capacity around no-fly zones and what you can do, what we can't do there because of what we don't have. Like, what kind of capacity do you foresee? And has chronic underfunding at all contributed to limits on that capacity? 
Unfortunately, it has, Bashi. And as always, Murray Brewster has all the facts. Bless him. Um, $12 billion has been not spent, reprofiled, rescheduled, moved to later years. There's all sorts of bureaucratic talk, which essentially is designed to obfuscate the fact that $12 billion that should have been spent over the last seven years on DMD and the Canadian Armed Forces has not been. And there's a cost to that in terms of operational readiness. But we're dealing with a crisis that is essentially unique in my 35 years as a soldier, indeed, since the end of the Second World War. And that's where we've got to think in terms of moving quickly, sending the troops and equipment over on the aircraft that we have designed to do such an activity, worry about the final training in Latvia or wherever we may go, though that would be illogical to go elsewhere than Latvia, uh, keeping in mind that you've still got some time that quite frankly is being earned the hard way through blood of the Ukrainian defenders who are slowing the Russians down. You were, uh, and I mean no disrespect by this at all, General Leslie, you were part of the government, you know, for, for a number of years that, that you say underfunded the, the, the military. Do you think that this, the scope of what's happening right now will prompt, and even the threat, you know, to our north, uh, which seems more immediate than ever before, will, will prompt a change in uh, posture of this government? Do you, do you think it will change the... Uh, or, or, or force them to re-examine the amount of money that they spend on defense? I sincerely hope so, because Putin, who's advancing across the Ukraine plains, slaughtering civilians as we speak, obviously felt he could win the war because he saw perceived weakness or lack of resolve, or he didn't see enough deterrent forces on the ground to cause him to pause, stop, and reevaluate his options. He felt he could do it. And it's our job now, because NATO was not ready a week ago, to buy that time, to make good use of that time that others are buying for us, to deploy the forces into position. Look, Ashley, where's the funding for the renewal of the North American Air Defense Agreement? It hasn't happened. The Americans have been asking us for years. Where's the Arctic investments? to better secure our North? Where are our new warships that were promised decades ago? Where is the decision on the new fighter aircraft that's been due for years? Where is the operations and training funds to actually get the Army, Navy, Air Force and their skill sets up to where it's needed? People have cashed a peace dividend, and I understand that. But all too often in the cycles of time and history, those who cash the peace dividend rue the day. They regret it bitterly when such things happen as Putin. And Putin is, in our definition, I believe, pretty much akin to a sociopath. So he's not going to stop. Why? Because we have the proof of what he's just finished doing or is in the process of trying to do to the Ukraine. We owe it to them to respond quickly. We don't have to wait. We're a sovereign nation. No general in NATO in their right mind is going to turn down 3,400 superb Canadian soldiers with their equipment arriving over the course of the next several weeks to go bolster battle positions along NATO's eastern flank. It's not going to happen. No one is going to say no. So let's gather our courage. Let's do the hard things. Let's do it right. But please do it now. Thank you, General Leslie. Appreciate your insights as always. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.